while I was in my storage locker the other day looking for something that I knew was packaged in a briefcase, I realised that I've got quite a few things that fell into that category, so I decided it might be a good idea to make an occasional series about these. So here's episode one of Interesting Things in Cases. You can tell a briefcase is a bit out of the ordinary when the badge on it reads Sanyo rather than Samsonite. This is a device that regularly got suggested to me as something I should cover, so let's do just that. Inside this case is a music centre. It's a G2615N to be precise. It consists of a record player, a radio tuner, a cassette recorder, and of course a pair of speakers. These form the lid of the case when it's closed, but when in use you detach them and you can spread them apart to give a wide stereo soundstage. These music centres in a briefcase were a regular feature throughout the 1970s in Sanyo's catalogues. There were a number of different models of them over the years, although the one I'm showing you today seems to be the most popular and the one that remained in the product line for the longest. I can really appreciate the appeal of these. It was a relatively compact and easily transportable version of the all-in-one music centres that were popular at the time, and it also offered the advantage of being slightly cheaper than the regular ones as well. For example, in 1973, this G2601 cost around £130, whereas the G2615 Portable was £30 less at £100, and it offered roughly the same feature set. It also had the advantage of looking a bit James Bond. Perhaps it's because I was a kid of the 70s, but to me, there's still something strangely appealing about tech when it's hidden inside a briefcase. But let's go through the features. First off, it can be powered by 6D cells, or via a power lead that connects to the three pin socket at the top left. There's a voltage selector as well below this. The far right of the case contains a telescopic antenna, as well as a long column of uniform silver knobs. Those are above the power switch, and here we've got volume, balance, tone, source, regular tuning, fine tuning, and radio band selectors for FM, medium wave, and short wave. We'll start off with that radio, and I was really very impressed by how well it pulls in a strong, clear stereo signal on a number of FM stations that I usually have difficulty receiving in this location. To Debbie in Leyland, you've got it right as well. As for shortwave, unsurprisingly, nowadays I can't pick a thing up. But 50 years ago, when this was new, there would have been a lot more broadcasting on those frequencies, and you would have been able to fine-tune the reception with the appropriate dial. Now, in the past, people in the US have asked me why I don't report on the AM, or medium wave performance of a radio. The reason is because where I live, I can just about bring in two muffled, largely unlistenable stations. And then a little bit of another one, so I just ignore that band entirely. But when it comes to the FM, it's a great radio. It's perhaps worth noting, though, there are different versions of this device with the same model number. For example, if you bought this Australian version, it doesn't have an FM. FM radio. Instead, it's got two shortwave bands. Now let's move on to the cassette deck. This feels and performs exactly the way you'd expect of a basic mid-1970s tape recorder. It's a no-frills device. While you could use it to play pre-recorded music tapes, when this came out it's far more likely you'd be using it to record your own voice or perhaps record off the radio and if you wanted you could also tape your records to play them on your car's stereo. The passage of time certainly won't have helped this tape player's performance improve, but this also wasn't a high-end cassette mechanism when it was new. Its biggest headline feature is Auto Stop, and that works only on play, not rewind. Also, fast forward only functions whilst the button is being held down, it doesn't lock in position, and this was common of machines of this era. When it comes to recording, it's got a manual level control and a single VU meter, although it does of course record and play in stereo. If you're not recording from the mics, it'll record from whatever source is playing at the time, and the quality of the recordings, whilst unremarkable and far from archive quality, is totally adequate for a machine of this type. And artifacts and objects online, and some of those, because of that, allow us to continue but moving on to the record player now, the arm is clamped down whenever the device is in transit, but it needs to be moved from its clamp to a separate rest whenever the power is on to turn off the turntable motor. This is a three-speed turntable, and between each speed option on the dial is an off position, 
Access to the speed selector is blocked though if a 12 inch record is in position. So you need to make sure that you pick your speed first. Again, as a record player, it's not going to win any awards, but it does play records, so it does what it set out to do. The arm features what looks like an adjustable weight at the back, but it's just for show. Looking underneath the arm, you can see that it uses a basic ceramic cartridge, so this is not going to get the best out of your records, but if you just want to hear what's on them, well, it'll work. As far as outputs go, there's a 6.35mm headphone jack, two line outs, one 3.5mm and the other 2.5mm. And then for the inputs we've got two microphone sockets, one for each channel. These small included mics are stored inside the base of each speaker. Each one of these has a clip-on stand. The mics are slightly different to each other. The right hand one incorporates a remote switch which enables the user to start and stop recordings from the microphone itself. And this addresses one of the missing features of this cassette deck. You might have noticed that it doesn't have a pause button. So if you wanted to record the charts off the radio, say, you'd have to do a lot of stopping and starting using these heavy mechanical buttons to cut out the DJ interrupting everything. However, if you were to plug the microphone in, you can use this as a pause button. If you're recording from the radio or a record, it won't pick up any audio through the microphones unless you also engage the mic mixing button. Okay, so far so good, but now let me tell you what I feel is the most frustrating aspect of this device as well as a bit of a missed opportunity. The first half of this sentence that describes the device in a catalogue highlights the issue. It says, open the case, split the lid into two stereo speakers, and a veritable sound studio is at your disposal. Yeah, you can't just open the lid, turn it on and start listening to something as you might expect. No, first you have to take it apart and set it up. This process requires removing the speakers from the back, opening the storage compartment on the bottom, extracting the speaker wire through there, then routing it back through a cutout in the door, replacing the plastic door, plugging the speaker wire into the top of the unit, and then repeat that for the other speaker. And this process isn't helped by the fit and finish of the plastic components. They're a lot fiddlier to handle than they've got any right to be for something that's intended to be used on a regular basis. That said, while it's not the correct way to go about things, it is just about possible to leave the wires attached to the speakers whilst the case is closed. You've got to make sure though that you don't catch the plugs in the back of it or snag the wires, but yeah, you can just about do it if you're careful, but clearly this was not how they intended it to be used. It would be so much better if whenever the speakers were attached, the audio connections to them were made through the hinges. Now, if you think that idea is pie in the sky, that's exactly what Sony did with their CFS88 boombox. When the fold-out speakers were attached to the main unit, the hinges completed the audio connections. It was only if you wanted to separate the speakers out away from the body that you then connected them up with wires. Of course, we're looking at a device here from a decade or so later, but it would have been nice if Sanyo had come up with something just a little bit neater, easier and better than what they did use. And it's especially frustrating because they went through multiple iterations of this device, but they never thought to improve this particular aspect of how they worked. None of them were ready to go when you lifted the lid. Due to the hassle of assembly and disassembly required every time you move them, I suspect that most people who had one of these just left them set up and didn't move them around more than absolutely necessary. They'd still be ideal though for someone to take with them to college or university and leave it set up in their student accommodation. In summary, what we have here are a basic cassette deck, record player and radio tuner attached up to basic speakers, but when put together in a case it forms something that perhaps becomes more than the sum of its parts. It's an object that looks way cooler than it really is, but also it does the job. Now if you were looking for a regular Sanyo Music Centre from 50 years ago you'd really struggle to find any for sale in decent condition, but due to the fact that every single one of these has been stored in its protective case, they regularly appear on eBay in various states of functionality.
Mine was restored to fully working condition by the previous owner, but if you plan on buying one of these, I should pass on an important tip. There were a few variations of this particular model. Some, like mine, have a three-pin power plug and some a two-pin, but whichever one of these you get, try to get it with the power lead included, as they all use a proprietary connection. If you do an online search for the power lead, all you're going to find is other people searching for the same thing. It seems like most of the leads have been mislaid. I suspect that's because there's no place to store them inside the unit itself. However, if I were you, I'd suggest giving this one a miss. While it does have a bit of wow factor when you open that lid, if you look a bit closer, it's just neatly packaged but fairly low-end early 1970s components. But of course, it's your call. Spend your money how you want. But remember, don't pay too much for one of these now that you know exactly what it is you're getting. Now, I do hope to feature more interesting things in cases in the future, but this particular case is now closed. So that's it for the moment. As always, thanks for watching.